A few months ago, I decided I wanted to turn Deet Bug Spray into a local anesthetic called Novocaine. Let's just pretend like this is a normal way to start a YouTube video. Sadly, by the time I finished converting all my bug spray into the first ingredient, I learned that Novocaine is actually prescription only, and therefore questionable for me to synthesize. So, instead of making an outdated painkiller, I decided to create the next best thing, an outdated performance enhancer that is internationally banned from the Olympics. This is nicethamide, a respiratory stimulant that is pretty much unregulated unless you're a professional athlete. Historically, it was used to help with tranquilizer overdoses, but these days, it's mostly taken to increase endurance at high altitudes, if it's taken at all. Again, this is a pretty outdated drug, and I'm pretty sure it's not even sold in the United States. Regardless, it's a cool chemical with a cool synthesis, so let's dive right in. Originally, I wanted to follow a pathway that involved ethyl nicotinate, mostly because it isn't nearly as dangerous as the chemicals I'll be showing later. However, I ran into a few issues when I tried preparing it. To get ethyl nicotinate, my plan was to basically follow the same procedure that works for making ethyl amino benzoate, or benzocaine, from vitamin B10 and ethanol, just with the vitamin B10 swapped for B3, aka nicotinic acid. And to maximize my yield, I decided to fully dry my ethanol before performing the sterification. To do this, I poured 250 milliliters of 95% ethanol into a 500 milliliter boiling flask. And with an efficient condenser attached, I slowly added a whopping 20 grams of metallic sodium. This is admittedly pretty overkill, but I rarely get to use my sodium. And I didn't feel like refluxing over magnesium or buying molecular sieves. Once the reaction died down, the setup was reconfigured for distillation, and the dry ethanol was distilled off. For the actual esterification, I went with 140 milliliters of ethanol, 25 grams of nicotinic acid, and 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid. At first, some of the nicotinic acid remained undissolved, but after boiling for a minute or two, the solution cleared up. With a reflux condenser attached, heating was continued for about two hours to ensure the reaction was reasonably complete. Now, so far, I've basically described a normal Fisher esterification, and based on the vaguely floral, ester-like aroma, I would say it probably worked as intended. The workup to isolate the product is where I'm pretty sure things got messed up. You see, in an esterification reaction like this, water is one of the products. So, if it's added or allowed to build up under acidic or basic conditions, the reverse reaction becomes more favorable and the ester gets destroyed. This is why it's best to quench the reaction quickly with cold sodium bicarbonate solution, which won't harm the ester. Unfortunately for me though, I forgot almost all this critical knowledge in the heat of the moment, and tried neutralizing the hot ester solution with concentrated sodium hydroxide. This likely destroyed a lot of the ethyl nicotinate, which I tried and failed to crash out using ice water. Could I have simply performed a solvent extraction to recover what was left of my product? Probably. But instead, I tried boiling off most of the ethanol in hopes that my product would crash out. Which did happen, but not in any meaningful amount. Again, boiling water and a pH imbalanced solution? Not the best for esters. I honestly forget what my logic was behind all this, probably because I didn't have any. Who knows where my brain was that day. Either way, you now know what didn't work, which means it's finally time for me to show you what did work. And spoiler alert, it didn't involve ethyl nicotinate. Before we move on to all that juicy performance enhancer content though, wouldn't you like to enhance your experience sitting at your desk right now? I certainly did, which is why I was super happy when FlexiSpot reached out and offered to sponsor this video. You see, as an engineering student taking senior level classes and a YouTuber who spends hours editing content, I tend to do a lot of sitting. And sadly, my old office chair wasn't exactly the image of stability, or even comfort for that matter. As you can see, the back was literally falling off. Thankfully, FlexiSpot sent me their ergonomic C7 Max chair, which has proven to be better in basically every conceivable way. In addition to being super easy to assemble, the C7 Max has several modes of adjustment on top of the usual up, down, and spin around. You can tweak the height and angle of the headrest for optimal comfort, along with the height of the backrest and 5D armrests, which are extremely versatile in the ways they can pivot. The lower back support on this chair is also pretty unique, as it focuses on the sacrum in a way that provides simultaneous and unmatched ergonomic support in the lumbar area. The durable latex seat is loaded with soft memory foam that makes sitting for long periods quite comfortable, 
and its depth can be adjusted with a simple pull of a lever. The enhanced stability of the C7 Max also ensures you can sit comfortably in almost any position, even cross-legged. And with the pop-out leg rest, fully reclining is also a very comfortable option. I've personally nodded off at least once in this chair, and I've only had it for about a month. I love it, it's great to work and relax in, and I very much recommend it. Plus, it's backed by FlexiSpot's 30-day risk-free trial period and a 10-year warranty with direct replacement for damaged parts. Use code C730 to get $30 off your C7 Max, or one of the other FlexiSpot chairs, like the more budget-friendly but still high-quality C5, or the more recently released C7 Morpher, which features an upgraded lumbar support and upper backrest. You can find all the links in the cards and video description. And now, back to the fun. To make nicethamide, I ended up going with the following reagents. Diethylamine, thionyl chloride, diethyl ether, dichloromethane, dimethylformamide, and nicotinic acid, otherwise known as niacin or vitamin B3. Most of these are pretty standard reagents, but thionyl chloride can be a bit tricky to source, since it's kind of a major precursor to a lot of banned drugs and chemical weapons. Still, it's legal to own, and I was able to get some from an old friend of the channel, Backyard Science 2000, on eBay. The diethylamine was made in a previous video, and it's actually the ingredient that ties bug spray into this whole mess. If you want to know the exact process, I posted the links below, but essentially, I just distilled a solution of DEET and sodium hydroxide in ethylene glycol. It was ridiculously easy and super high yielding. Now, nicethamide is an amide, made by connecting diethylamine and nicotinic acid. The problem is regular carboxylic acids don't really link up with amines to form amides. They need to be converted into a more reactive species first. An ester like ethyl nicotinate probably would have worked fine, but since I was a doofus and botched the preparation, I decided to go with something much more reactive. Nicotinyl chloride, the acid chloride of nicotinic acid. To make it, I first loaded a 50 milliliter flask with 20 milliliters of cold thionyl chloride. This stuff is honestly pretty nasty, so if for some reason you decide to do this yourself, remember to use proper gloves, eyewear, and breathing protection. A fume hood would also be a good idea, since a lot of toxic and corrosive fumes tend to be produced. Anyway, next, 10 grams of fluffy nicotinic acid was carefully stirred in over the course of a few minutes, along with a somewhat optional 2-3 drops of dimethylformamide to act as a catalyst. This resulted in some hydrogen chloride and sulfur dioxide off-gassing, but with a water bath keeping things relatively cool, the reaction thankfully didn't run away prematurely. Then, with everything added, a reflux condenser was connected, the water bath was brought to a boil, and a bubbler trap was set up to capture most of the noxious fumes. As the thionyl chloride began to reflux, the nicotinic acid was quickly converted into nicotinyl chloride, and sulfur dioxide was released from solution. Hydrogen chloride was also evolved, but it reacted with the nicotinyl chloride's pyridine ring, stabilizing the compound as its hydrochloride salt. Additionally, the prolonged heating caused some of the thionyl chloride to decompose into sulfur monochloride, which discolored the solution and unfortunately made my working area reek like a greasy sulfur turd. It seems no matter how hard you try, sulfur always finds a way to make things unpleasant. After three hours of refluxing, most of the remaining thionyl chloride and sulfur monochloride was distilled off, leaving behind a lovely crop of nicotinyl chloride hydrochloride. This was washed with two 25 milliliter portions of diethyl ether to remove any leftover impurities. And with that, it was finally time to make some nicethamide. To do this, I first suspended the solid in about 20 milliliters of dichloromethane, which acts as a solvent for the final product. Then, a condenser was set up, along with an addition funnel filled with 12 milliliters of diethylamine. This actually represents a pretty big excess, but I wanted to ensure all the nicotinyl chloride reacted without expelling a bunch of hydrogen chloride gas. As soon as the stopcock was opened, a thick white smoke of diethylamine hydrochloride began to fill the flask, and the solution gradually shifted from white to a more yellowish color. The heat also caused the dichloromethane to begin boiling and refluxing in the condenser. In this reaction, the nicotinyl chloride hydrochloride reacts directly with diethylamine to form nicethamide and hydrogen chloride. It's a pretty straightforward reaction that's pretty hard to mess up, although the presence of water can decrease the yield slightly by converting the acid chloride back into nicotinic acid. The final mix came out as a thick sludge, thanks to all the precipitated diethylamine hydrochloride. 
To remove this and extract the nicethamide, I wash the mixture with a solution of 6.5 grams of sodium hydroxide in water. The sodium hydroxide is kinda unnecessary, but I want to remove any stray nicotinic acid and convert the hydrochloride to pure diethylamine, which could be easily boiled off. This might have been another mistake though, as you'll see momentarily. The dichloromethane layer containing the nicethamide was surprisingly on top, due to the increased density of the salty aqueous layer and the lower density of nicethamide. After washing the aqueous layer with more DCM, the extracts were combined and boiled down to remove the solvent. Then, a strong vacuum was pulled on the distillation setup, and the nicethamide was distilled over. Ultimately, this should have been the final step, and the product I wound up with should have been almost perfectly pure. But naturally, I had to screw up something completely trivial. You see, to keep the glass joints vacuum tight, I lubed them up with a kind of hydrocarbon grease. I was a bit too liberal when I applied it, and some of it managed to get pulled into the receiving flask with the nicethamide. This completely threw off the melting point, and made solutions of it appear cloudy. Additionally, there were crystals floating around the solution, even above nicethamide's room temperature melting point. This was almost certainly nicotinic acid, and I'm guessing it formed when I added the sodium hydroxide. No worries, this just meant that I needed to do another workup. In this case, I dissolved 6 grams of my dirty nicethamide in an arbitrary amount of sodium bicarbonate solution, and then added heptane to pull out the vacuum grease. This worked exceptionally well, based on how the solution lost its cloudiness. Of course, I still had to pull the nicethamide out of the aqueous solution, which was now heavily loaded with sodium salts. Thankfully, I could basically just repeat the dichloromethane extraction that worked earlier, which is exactly what I did. The extracts were once again combined and boiled down, but this time, I dragged the product over sodium sulfate and skipped the vacuum distillation step. I figured that the product was already pure enough from the first vacuum distillation, and that simply heating it on a boiling water bath would be enough to remove the leftover dichloromethane. We'll see soon enough, though. In total, I obtained 5.25 grams of clean, slightly yellow nicethamide. Mind you, this was from working up only 6 grams of my original material, which weighed 8.5 grams, so my total theoretical weight would have been something like 7.4 grams. This comes out to a respectable 51% yield, which I'm fairly happy with. To be sure this was my product though, and that all the impurities were removed, I decided to mail a sample to Vince over on Neptunium, who was willing to run it through his mass spectrometer. This is essentially a big machine that tells you what something is made of. And thankfully, my sample did turn out to be basically pure nicethamide. Great to confirm my chemistry was on point in this episode. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are probably hoping that I'll throw caution to the wind and test the stuff on myself like I did with that ultra-potent caffeine analog last year. Let me tell you why that will absolutely not be happening this time. I am willing to put my body on the line for science, but only under very specific circumstances. If something is potentially hazardous to my health, I tend to avoid it. And sadly, nicethamide sets off quite a few alarms. For one, it's pretty outdated, and I couldn't really determine a proper dose. There are a few pills or lozenges from other countries that claim to contain something like 100 milligrams of it, but I can't really verify how accurate this is. Additionally, nicothamide's effective dose apparently lies very close to its not-so-effective toxic dose, so the likelihood of me experiencing beneficial or even noticeable effects would be kind of low. There are a variety of less pleasant side effects as well, and on top of everything, I don't usually have the best reactions to cardiovascular stimulants. So yeah. I'm not in the mood to push my luck with this one. All that being said, I do hope you've enjoyed this video, and that you'll consider subscribing to my channel or becoming a channel member. I've got a lot of crazy content coming soon that you do not want to miss. Like, for example, building an insanely powerful plasma rifle, deploying a 360 camera in front of a tornado, and stealing the Coca-Cola secret formula with the help of mass spectrometry. As always, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Without them, I probably wouldn't be able to afford a lot of my projects. Remember to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Lab Coats, out.